What's up, world? I go by the name of Jabari. Another Monday, another Words with Friends podcast. And if you are sleeping, if you didn't know, you can support the Words with Friends podcast on Patreon. That's right, if you're getting value from the podcast. If you enjoy these conversations with entrepreneurs, artists, and all around just creative individuals, and if it's inspiring you, then please support the Words with Friends podcast with a $1 tip, as little as a $1 tip, on patreon.com slash jabari, p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash jabari. You can sign up and support with as little as a $1 tip. All right, now that that's out the way, thank you guys so much for listening. Today is very special. I have a good friend of mine in or on the podcast today, Rob Ford, um, and Rob does many different things, but I will let him introduce himself to you guys. All right, uh, Rob Ford here, um, born and raised Los Angeles, California, graduate of Howard University, um, founder of the Creative Mind Group, which is a international uh, film program company where we take film students and recent gra- graduates to uh, to film programs all around the world. Uh, the Cannes Film Festival, the Toronto Film Festival, the Sundance Film Festival. Uh, where else are we at? Berlin and uh, here in Los Angeles at the American Film Market. Uh, aside from that, or in between going to the festivals, if you will, I also uh, produce uh, documentary television, a.k.a. reality. Uh, and that's me. Yep. So... Man, let's start. Uh, I met Rob because I was a participant, um, and I went to the Creative Minds in Cannes film program. That was back in 2008. Eight. That was the first year I went. Yeah. Yep. Uh, then I came back and uh, helped out and sort of worked on the program and some, some film stuff uh, in 2009. But, um, okay, so Rob, explain a little bit to people about how you got involved in film festivals and wanting to go to film festivals because and when you just say that intro it's like you know yeah we take kids to different film festivals all across the world but like how did all of this start you know did you go to a film festival and what made you even want to go to a film festival and then what made you want to bring film students to all of these various film festivals gotcha 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 all right so um yeah so i i graduated from howard in 2004 with the uh, journalism degree, broadcast journalism, originally wanted to do the whole like ESPN, Stuart Scott, kind of Chris Berman move, um, but then I realized that wasn't really for me, and I wanted to get into film. Oh, you wanted to like host like uh, ESPN, like oh, like yeah, uh, I wanted basically talk show. Sports okay. Center. Okay. That was like the dream scenario okay. right there. Um, but but like I said, I realized that I didn't want to go in that direction, so I wanted to get into film. So literally, um, the day I graduated from Howard. It was like Saturday, 10 a.m. or something that morning. I graduated. Saturday, 10 p.m. that night, I flew to France for the first time leaving the country. I just got my passport. And I went to another program um, at the Cannes Film Festival um, with the idea of, hey, I just graduated. I don't know anybody. I'm trying to break into the industry. I need to get some contacts. I need to get a mentor. I need to learn how this business really works. No better place to go to do that than the Cannes Film Festival. Um, and so I got there, and, you know, without uh, putting myself in some legal turmoil, it didn't go as expected. Um, and so I, I left a little unhappy and disgruntled, but I did see that there was um, a wealth of, of opportunity at the festival. If the situation had been put together correctly, it could have been accessed by individuals like myself. Mm. And so even then, I still wasn't looking to start anything. I just kind of saw the window of opportunity. And if anything, I would like maybe pass the word to a couple of friends. And so the next year, 2005, I tried to um, come back with the entity that I had went into, to the festival with in 2004. Um, and I tried to come back with them in a variety of ways, and unfortunately, they were not supportive in any of those ways, um, which, you know, retrospect was a blessing in disguise because it forced me to figure it out on my own, and that's pretty much what happened. They didn't help, so I came back to the festival on my own in 2005. Um, now, mind you, for, I mean, for those that don't know, the Cannes Film Festival is the biggest film festival in the world, right? That the is most 
premier film festival and just give a little bit of background for listeners that may not exactly know what a film festival is and you know what 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 does what does the whole thing entail right so there's uh what they call festivals and then there's what they call markets so festivals are primarily about just screening movies it's about discovering talent it's about breaking new films or new directors and just essentially like celebrating the art of film markets are primarily in most cases exclusively about the buying and selling of films and the Cannes Film Festival has gotten to where it is as the most prominent the most respected the the biggest in the world one because it's been going on for almost 70 years I think they just finished 67 uh, this past May um, but two and most importantly you know as, as they always say numbers never lie like it generates the most amount of money on an international level for the entire world as it relates to buying and selling films so in in sort of common speak what that means is if i make a movie as rob ford and i, I don't work with or for a major studio paramount fox or whatever i can take that movie to the Cannes film festival i can buy a booth space and i can basically sell that movie to countries in australia and countries in europe and countries in asia in countries in South America, and for every territory that you sell the film, you get a licensing right. So depending on how good your film is, how much you spend, how much you're asking, you know, you can make fifty, sixty, seventy, or two, three, four, five hundred thousand dollars per country, per territory, times twenty, thirty, forty countries. You know, depending on how good your sales is, and that's how you really make money in the film game. I mean, there are huge movies like a Transformers that'll come out in the box office and do 100 200 300 million dollars whatever the case may be at the local amc and lowe's and all that here in the states but as far as the world is concerned if you really want to make money and you want to have a huge picture or if you're independent and you don't need to have a huge picture and a huge budget but you just want to make money on top of what you invested you take your fest your, your film excuse me to market festivals and you sell the rights, and that's how you can get in the game independently, you know, and a, a, as a hustler and do your own thing without having to be uh, beholden to the studio system of please, you know, pick up my movie, please fund my movie, please distribute my movie, please put it out on Friday next to, you know, the the big Mark Wahlberg new release or whatever the case may be. Um, you can do it yourself and, and market. So American Film Market is one that we're at here in Los Angeles. That's the biggest film market in the States. Uh, the Berlin, Ber, it's called uh, Berlin Alley uh, EFM, which stands for European Film Market. That's the biggest one solely just for Europe. Um, is Europe's version of AFM, essentially. And then Cannes is the biggest film festival as far as markets go in the world. And the concept is really simple. So let's say you have a film and you want to sell it to uh, Melbourne, Australia. You want to sell it to Shanghai, China. You want to sell it to South Africa. You want to sell it to Canada. And you want to sell it to Brazil. So normally you would have to get all these people on the phone or go to these places and pitch the idea and get them in a room and get them to sell it. Or the alternative is you just come to Cannes for two weeks. All these people are already there, and you literally just set up meetings, you know, one after the other, booth by booth or day by day. So it's an opportunity to get the world all on one place at one time to do business for two weeks, and it generates a ridiculous amount of money, which is why it is what it is. And so, you know, so the difference between, because a lot of people, you know, in America have heard of stuff like the Sundance Film Festival. Sundance Film Festival is a little different because it doesn't have a market uh, attached to it, right? So that is solely um, a film festival for people to showcase films and showcase their work and for it to be talked about in press and stuff like that, right? That is correct, yes. Sundance Film, so the five that we're at are the ones that are popular in the States. Sundance, um, which we're at Tribeca, uh, Telluride, um, South by Southwest, uh, you know, those are probably like the top tier ones. Those are all festivals where, one, the public can come, two, uh, it's about showcasing talent and art, and three, um, the, the, the festivals are more just about finding the best possible films and talents they can, showcasing them 
and then giving them a platform to, to sort of be awarded for their talents. Now, granted, business is done and transacted at those festivals, um, if, if especially by the films that do really well. But it just doesn't have a standard and a formal setup of like a marketplace. Like mm -hmm. it can, for example, the best equivalent for those who you know, haven't been there to give you a visual, it's like going to a job fair. So you walk into this huge building and there's just companies set up in booths all over the place for like three or four levels. And then there's a whole strip, almost like Las Vegas, um, with hotels. And then all these hotels are even more companies, you know, doing business. And so that is what a market looks like. There's people there that have solely purchased space to bring product, to do business. And that's the only reason why they're there. Um, festivals like Sundance is, is more about... Um, a film sort of breaking through or putting itself on the map or a new director who is getting an opportunity to get his shine because he got into Sundance and the film won and everybody's talking about it. So those become more like buzz festivals. You know, it's, it's if you're trying to be like discovered or break into the game and get people to notice you, you usually do that at festivals because that's the platform that they have. If you're trying to buy and sell your product, you, you want to go to a market. That's the place for that. Okay. Um, okay, so now that people have a framework of, you know, what film festivals are and what they entail, so let's get back to you and, you know, uh, you going there for the second time on your own, you know, traveling across the world and, and saying, okay, well, what, what, what was in your mind at that point? Like, what did you want to accomplish on that second visit to Ken? Truth be told, uh, at that point in time in my life, I was... I was in a very pivotal state, you know. Um, I didn't have, like, a real job. I had been out of school for a year. I was doing, like, temp agency stuff in, like, law firms in D.C., and I was doing little odd jobs and side gigs. I had started, like, a movie night at Howard, which I was doing, like, once a month, screening, you know, films from a studio contact I had made at Cannes the year prior, um, and just trying to hustle, you know, and, and figure it out. Uh, simultaneously on, like, the personal end of life, um, I had a kid um, at that time, um, or within the time of the, the, the last year from one can to another. And so I was also, you know, back against the wall, so to speak, about, like, I got to figure out my life and my situation to be able to provide. And so I was kind of all over the place. Um, and so I had met a friend in Cannes in 2004 who we got really tight and we equally were disappointed with our experience. That's what kind of allowed us to bond. And so um, he hit me up like, yo, it's, uh, it's getting close to that time. You know what I'm saying? I want to go back. You want to roll? And I was like, yeah, but I can't afford it, you know? Um, so I don't really see how that can happen. And I was like, I can't make sense out of spending the money even if I had it to go if I'm not getting something out of it you know like a job or money um to, to be specific and so he was like well I don't want to be out there by myself you know we got good energy we really know how to network well together and meet people and you know kind of push ideas so it's like uh I want you there so he was like how about you know I front you the money for the uh for the expenses and then you get it back to me when you can and I'm a prideful dude and, you know, don't like taking handouts or whatnot. So it was tough for me to accept, but I wanted to go back, you know, and I feel like it was a good move because I was once again in a transitional period. And it's a good place to kind of ground yourself and reconnect. So I accept it. Um, and, uh, and I actually, you know, shout out to her, got some help from my, my daughter's mom. She, she sponsored the plane ticket. Um, and I went and, uh, we got there the first day in the organization, that we were a part of last year, um, they were now basically charging an admission fee just to come into their physical space at the festival. And uh, for us, though, as it seems very small, maybe to the listeners, th that was actually like, the, as they say, the straw that broke the camel's back because we felt like they were already like not producing a quality product. Then they didn't help us, and now we're coming back and we have to pay a fee just to come in and like check our internet. And we've already paid them money last year to be here. And, you know, we're alumni. And it just felt like, as we say, it was like capitalism on steroids to the infinite power. You know, mm -hmm. it's just Americans ODing 
as we're often looked at in the international market, it's just being like too money hungry. Mm -hmm. And so that was the moment where we were like, okay, we're going to pay this money to go into to this space, but we have to do it with an objective and a purpose. And the objective and the purpose is we're going to tell everyone that's in the program this year that we know you hate it, we know you're unhappy, we know you want your money back, but you can't do anything at this point. So we're going to create a program, come back with us next year. Our program is going to be way better. It's going to be way more along the lines of what you thought you were getting yourself into. You know, one of those, like, by the people, for the people type of things. Mm -hmm. And so we started giving out business cards and telling people and just talking it up, and, you know, the buzz was created. But we didn't know what we were doing. We didn't have a, a name. We didn't have a website. We didn't have a legally recognized entity. We were just two young dudes just trying to kick up some dust, you know. But you know what's so, so important about that story is that you didn't have any of the, you know, the uh, the quote-unquote necessities for a business, right? No website. You maybe had a few cards, but you didn't have that much of a, that much of a framework of what you knew what was going to happen. But you did have a solution to a problem, you know what I mean? And that, just from being an entrepreneur and just like, you know, you being one of my mentors and seeing a lot of other people success in business, at the end of the day, that is what you need, number one. You know what I mean? It's like having a solution to a problem. That is, that's, that's, the, that's the special sauce, you know what I mean? If you just come up with an idea, but there's a thousand other people doing it, or it doesn't fill a void in some need of people, it's like, you're not really going to do much. It's true, because then you have to sell people on it and kind of force them to, to get involved in, you know, the market. I mean, the market's got to be good in general, but it's got to be super savvy yeah. when you're trying to sell something that people don't need or feel like they have a hundred other options to get it. And you're right. Um, you know, what? What? not like thinking about it on a global scale, but retrospectively, you know, when we decided to do what we want to do, this company was the only other company in the marketplace doing it. So they they essentially had a monopoly, which meant there was so much more opportunity for an alternative. You know, it's, it's, we always say it's like they were Coca-Cola, you know, the old school brand that had been there for the longest that everybody knew that everybody was drinking. And then, boom, we popped up and it's like, here's Pepsi. You know, it's young, it's fun, it's hip. And if nothing else, it's an option, you know, yeah. and that's what people want. They want the ability to, to have a choice. And we knew their product wasn't solid, so it was it was kind of a, a sitting duck. And so um, we uh, and we also knew, too, going back to your point, like this is not something we have to convince people to to, to get involved with. Like people are coming here in droves every year, period, you know. And there's so many more who aren't coming, who want to come. They just don't know how, mm -hmm. you know, and they need someone to kind of facilitate that process. Uh, so it, it was it was wide open. Um, and so what happened was, you know, the festival was two weeks long. So over the course of, of the first week or so, uh, what I failed to mention early in the story was Kodak was one of the sponsors of the other organization. And so... Um, they found out what we were doing, what we were saying, you know, sort of the the drama we were creating, if you will. And they got word to us through, you know, a mutual friend who was in the, the, in the program that they wanted to meet. And so uh, we were, to be honest, paranoid because we thought, OK, if they are the sponsor, which means the money and we're sort of creating you know, bad, you know, uh, word, if you will, in, in the community of, of what this, this company is doing, uh, we're pretty sure they're going to, like, drop some strong language on us and some legal threats and basically tell us, like, to shut up, you know, mm -hmm. in a legal professional matter. And so we take the meeting, really not have much of a choice, and uh, they basically tell us, you know, hey, we're the sponsor, um, we're in the last year of our contract with this organization, we're not really happy with our relationship, how things are going, so we're not going to renew. Uh, we're looking for alternative options to kind of stay in this space and do other things. And we hear you have some ideas, so what do you got? And, dude, we were just like, it was just a complete 180 from what we, you know, envisioned this meeting would yeah. be. And we were totally unprepared for that question and that proposal. Um 
and didn't have anything to really say because once again we hadn't thought it through we hadn't put together a business plan a proposal a website you just knew that you in in a in a different sort of capacity you were going to get people who wanted to come to the festival there yes okay yeah and the getting them there was 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 not really the thing or that was a small part because i the one thing i give the other organization credit for it's just that they got me there. Like, mm-hmm. I can't argue with that. I can't deny that they did that. That was legitimate, and I appreciate that. Because had I not gotten there, then none of this would have ever even happened. But the problem was when you got there. When I got okay. there, like yeah. it was. That's they. They were done. Like, okay, we got you here. You got a room. You got a badge. You're at the festival. Go. You know, um, they didn't provide any introductions. They didn't facilitate any structure. They didn't have an environment that fostered networking or learning or connecting with the industry. Um, I mean, me being me, I made the best of it because I spent my money and I was there for two weeks. And I'm like, I can't just leave getting, you know, taken advantage of. But there was easily like over 150 people in the program and all of them didn't take full advantage or didn't know how, you know, the way I did. And that's who I was more focused on and thinking about versus myself. And so... Um, I just, yeah, I, I, I just, I, I knew, you know, um, that if there was a, 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 a situation or a structure or a program that was more hands-on with ushering, connecting, developing, cultivating, networking, the people that were there with the festival, I, I thought it could have l- limitless possibilities. Mm-hmm. But you, you, you had to take an active, conscious uh, deliberate choice that that was going to be what you were going to do and what your program was about. And that wasn't what they were doing. They were about this space and the space just to kind of paint a picture for for folks. I keep saying physical space organization and being very, you know, uh, dubious with, with the description, but the space is essentially like a, uh, Starbucks, meets a FedEx Kinko's kind of all rolled into one. It's a place mm. where you go and you have some coffee, you can take a meeting, you can make photocopies, you can check your internet. Maybe there's a, a, a demonstration display of like a new tech product or whatever the case may be. Um, and so what, what, what the challenge is, is most of the people in the other program work in that space. And it doesn't really breed an opportunity to network with the industry and to make an impression on someone because they look at you as like a, a, a wait staff person or a host staff or, you know, a door person. They're not looking at you as like a future industry professional, so they should take you serious and give you an opportunity. And that was the fault in what they were doing, in my opinion, and what we wanted to resolve. And so um, we're, we're in the Kodak meeting back to that. And um and they basically say, what do you got? And we say, can we get a few days to kind of like put together something and, 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 and meet again? They say, yeah, absolutely. So we go back to, you know, the drawing board and we kind of hash out basically the main sort of fundamental points of what we wanted to do and the goals and the objectives we wanted to achieve, which, you know, a lot of which have kind of already just, just touched upon. And that's what we came back to the, to the previous, I mean, to the next meeting with um, and presented to them. And they dug it, and they were like, yeah, we like this. This sounds good. So post-festival, we need to do a follow-up meeting back in L.A. where we can really hammer this thing out in grave detail and kind of lay out a, a rollout plan um, and then take it from there. So at this time, I was living, I think, in New York. Yeah, I was living in New York, um, and I had gotten flown from New York to L.A., which for me was like, awesome and surreal because I'm from LA born and raised but now I'm living in New York being flown to LA for business which is just a it's just a totally different kind of you know this young guy is fresh out of school I'm usually paying my own ticket to come to LA to see my family and so I come out for like maybe a week and I spend three or four days at the Kodak offices and we're just like hammering out this proposal of what this program is going to look like and I think by the end of the the time frame we had maybe like a 24 to 36 month rollout of like Here's what we're going to do. Mm. Everybody was happy. Everybody was excited. You know, we're ready to, to, to put this thing together. So the next step was we had to present the idea to their, you know, their board to get it, get it funding, you know, to get the funding to finance the, the launch of the program. And that meeting, I believe, was supposed to happen like a month or so later back in New York. And so we were just waiting for date and time for that to happen. And then maybe three weeks or something after the initial meeting in L.A., we... Um, we get an email 
basically saying that uh, Kodak is doing bad financially. Mm. Um, this is kind of like when the digital age just started to like really kick in and nobody's yeah. like buying. Are starting to yes, pop up. Yeah, exactly. Nobody's buying yeah, film, so yeah. nobody's shooting on film and they're just hemorrhaging money. And so uh, they basically were like, we're doing bad. In a nutshell, we are no longer uh, moving forward with any sort of new ventures or new programs. All of, you know, new funding is on hold until indefinite notice, you know. Um, and that obviously was like a major, you know, blow to us because we were just like thinking our lives are getting ready to start. We're going to be working for Kodak, traveling the world, running these programs, helping people break into the business. It was kind of a dream, you know. And then, boom, just, like, out of nowhere, the emergency break is pulled. Yeah. And it's just like, no, nah, it's not happening. You know, we don't have the money. We don't know when we're going to have the money. So you're on standby until we figure right. it out. And so, you know, you know, I, I guess uh, for us or for those listening, for anybody, it was an entrepreneurial crossroads, right? It was the moment of, like, all right, well, do we wait for Kodak to figure out how they're going to combat this digital wave, which, as of this conversation, they still haven't figured out, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> you know, and that's, like, almost 10 years later, uh, and, and then come back to us, and then we renew, you know, what we were doing, or do we say, we're just going to do it ourselves, and whenever Kodak, if Kodak gets together, they can holler at us then and become a sponsor or just drop some money or throw their name on it or however they want to get involved. And so we chose the latter, which is like, we're going to do it ourselves. Fortunately, we hadn't signed any type of contracts. N you know, no, no ideas were beholden to, to one specific party. Um, so in essence, we had the freedom to go and do our own thing without any violation. Mm -hmm. So that's what we decided to do. We decided to start our own program, and we ended up uh, launching the first program, um, in 2006 at the uh, Cannes Film Festival. It was very small, maybe like five people. And it was primarily like our immediate circle of friends um, that wanted to get access to the festival. Um, we really had no clue still what we were doing. I mean, we had, we had got further than we were before. We did have a name and a website and, you know, some, some marketing materials. But as far as structure of the program and how we were going to help people and what they were going to do once they got there... It was still very much a work in progress. So we actually started with just what we call the networking program because my buddy and I at that time, that's what we were great at. We were great at networking, going into places and talking to strangers and, and working the room. So we figured, okay, well, we tell people what we did and how we did it and then give them the tools to go out and do it themselves and they'll be successful. And what we quickly realized is like everybody's not built like that. Yeah, yeah. Some people need a, a schedule. Some people need... A location to go to work and the set responsibilities um, and then some people don't even want to be involved in it. some people want to create and make film and put their hands on equipment and get that kind of experience and so you know each year we continue to refine the program and learn and make little tweaks here and there till we finally got it to where it you know really is going to be what it is and I think that was probably the year that you came which is 2008 that was the first year we had a internship program um, where you basically work a job f with the company at the festival with the hopes of getting hired after mm -hmm. if you do well. Um, we had a filmmaking program where you make a five-minute short film the first week of the festival, and then the second week of the festival, we screen the short films and give away prizes to the top movies. And then the third component is the networking program, which is the one we originally started with, where you just kind of come, and if you have a product or you want to meet people, you can shop the product, you can go to parties, you can you can network. You can basically advance your product and expand your network base, your contacts, your Rolodex. And so that was, like, 2008 was the first year we had all three of those programs working together simultaneously, you know, as our complete program. But even from then, it probably took another three or four years to massage each of those individual programs into the place of where they are now to really get in their true identity. Now, you know, there's, you know, something I want to touch on is like when I went in 2008, you know, first off, it was one of the, I mean, it was the first time, well, second time that I had traveled outside of the country, but at this time, 
the the only time I had been outside of the country prior was Panama, and I went on like a volunteer trip when I was at Howard to Panama, and that was literally uh, four weeks before, you know. So oh, it was wow. like, yeah, that was back like, to back yeah, it was back to back international trips for the first time. And, I mean, I was so pleased with the program. So for you to even be like, oh, we still had to get so much better and we started to do so much. I mean, I, I left the program, you know, I mean, little did I know that, like, in that program, I was, you know, not only going to meet you and our relationship was just going to go stronger and stronger. But, you know, people like, uh, I, I met my, at the, t at the time, he was just a program participant just like me. But now he's my lawyer. You know, so shout out to Sebastian. Um, just different friends that I met in the program, from my friend Marcus to, you know, Jihad and all these people who I'm really close with and we still have some sort of uh, relationship. It, they, it all spawned from being in this program. And um, and even just like I have friends that I met that live in Cannes, you know what I mean? <laughs> that like, uh, that I still stay in contact with to this day. One of them, um, Chloe, was just here in LA learning English and like you know what I mean it's like it's crazy the the amount of people that I'm connected with um, and that I know just from the program and the experience that I had in the program like I, I interned with the, with the, I forget the name of the company but it was like a sales and distribution company I think it might be a Vision Films Vision Films yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and uh, and I you know I, I was able to understand and learn how films are sold in the marketplace like this and, and now that's helping me understand how to finance and you know produce my own film that I'm working on right now. So like all of this stuff was just like it was a great program for me, and it was just it's crazy to hear that there was still so much work to be done. You know, so that's that's just one uh, one part of, of 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 what I really want to get into, which is you know at this time you're doing all of this stuff um, and you're sort of. I don't, what's the word, but like all this stuff is going on and and there's no official title or, you know, you're kind of just doing this like as a, almost a spectator in, in, in regards to the actual Cannes Film Festival, right? Right. So like I want to talk a little bit about that and, and sort of your, your history <laughs> with, with them, with as much as you can get into, obviously. Right, yeah. Um, but, you know, like, so, so yeah, so, you know, you can explain it a bit better than I can. For sure. So, um, and that's, yeah, it's good to bring that. So, what happened was, <clears throat> um, once we decided that we weren't, or, or once Kodak decided they, they didn't have the money to do it and we were going to do our own thing, our next immediate, immediate step, excuse me, was to approach the festival directly, basically saying, hey, this is who we are. This is the idea we have. How do we, you know, work with you to um, actually like implement it and to, to put it into play, you know, in official, formal, uh, supported fashion? And so they uh, they they weren't responsive, unfortunately. And and I, I guess I can't really blame them because uh, we were just two young guys. We we didn't have like amazing credits. We hadn't produced Oscar award winning films and. You know, we didn't have a lot to show uh, besides an idea. And so once we started uh, moving forward on our own, um, and I guess we, again, created a little bit of, of a noise or some buzz, then they found out about it and they reached out directly. And the first kind of wave of that was they were basically, um, they sent a really aggressive legal letter stating uh, we had to make a lot of changes to our website. Um, some of the language, some of the images, you know, logo usage, um, a bunch of stuff. And and I, you know, in, in their defense, it, I think it was valid request because uh, we, we, we were kind of ODing a little bit, um, but we we didn't know no better, and nobody was responding to us, so we did what we thought was best. Uh, so we, you know, we we adhered to all of their requests, and we sent a letter back apologizing, as well as confirming that we had did everything they asked of us and were asking if we were essentially like all good to move forward. They sent a letter back responding saying, um, basically, uh, yes, everything, you know, has been adhered to as we asked, but we see that it, it, it looks as though you're still looking to do a program and we have not given, you know, our blessings essentially for that. So basically, like, we'll be watching you is yeah, the yeah. moral of the story. And so that was that. And so then 
maybe, uh, I don't know, three or four, uh, maybe, I don't know, weeks or months or something like that. After Sometime thereafter, um, we got a uh, phone call. And someone was asking about the program and what we offer and what we can do, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, we were very forward with the information, what we were offering. Uh, Again, being young, being naive, and just trying to, you know, do as much business as you can. We we, we weren't really using filters. We we just kind of very transparent. And so uh, we, you know, provided some information. And, you know, uh, I always tell people, I mean, my favorite TV show all time is like The Wire. So it, it it was it was like I was on The Wire. Like I felt like I was talking to someone who had someone else on the phone. Like the call was being recorded. It was some real street covert, like <laughs> I'm being set up here yeah. type stuff, you know. And so you know, I was actually on the call. I said some things on the call, and then I sent. And this is the, this was the the real gotcha gotcha. I sent an email following up on the call. And the email basically, you know, I, I proclaimed and advertised to offer things from the program that the festival in our previous encounter has said that we, we can't say we can do. Um, and, you know, that, that, was, that was bad. And so maybe a week or so after that call, I get another legal letter. And this time the legal letter is basically saying, um, you know, we warned you. We told you we'd be watching, and you still continue to do <laughs> what we told you you shouldn't. Yeah. So you're banned from the festival. Oh, wow. um, you can't come. Don't show up. You won't be allowed access. Your accreditation will be revoked, et cetera, et cetera. I and mean, this is you individually as this, Rob Ford. Yes. This is this is not the program, the company. You know, this is the, the participants. This is Robert Ford. It was sent to me, addressed to me, used my name. And it, it was all me, and so um, I. Uh, and, and, mind and was you, there a timeline on this ban? Was it like a sorry, lifetime yes, ban? Sorry, yes, no. Or? It was it was a two year ban. Okay, um, is is what it was. And the ban or this this letter was sent to me in April, and the festival was in May. So at this point, <laughs> I've already booked my flight. I've already booked my hotel. I had my own short film that had been accepted to the festival. They terminated that. I had already paid for my badge. They terminated that. Um, and they basically... Did they was, give you a refund? They did. Oh, okay. But they made a point to say, uh, we are making an exceptional, you know, English is not the best. But basically, they made a point to say, like, we don't have to, and we normally wouldn't give a refund in yeah. a situation, but we will make an exception yeah. for you. You know what I mean? <laughs> And, and granted, I was thankful because the, the badges are not cheap. Uh, but at the same time, it was like that there was a much bigger, you know, issue at hand at that yeah, time. Yeah. And so, uh, and so I was banned. You know, I couldn't come to the festival. Uh, and like I said, this is a, a month before the uh, actual program is getting ready to start. And it's just. I, again, it was like the Kodak thing all over. Just like, oh my God, now what do I do? You know, do I not go? Do I go? How can I help? How are we gonna run this program? Like, it's just total disarray with like weeks to go before this thing is gonna like launch. And so, you know, I, I kind of slept on it for a little bit. And I thought I was like, okay, well, you know, I have a passport. This is still just a city. It's not like the festival is the only thing there. Um, I can they can't stop me from going to the city of Cannes. Yeah, yeah. I just can't go to the festival and the festival venues and the festival screenings, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I was like, well, in theory, do I even need all of that to, to be there to run the program? Like, I know where things are and how it operates. And nine times out of ten, I spend most of my time at the hotel anyway, just kind of quarterback in the operation. So I was like, dude, I'm just going to go and, and wing it. And just kind of figure out, you know, how to make the best of it. So I did. Um, I went, and the program was tough, and it was turbulent. And and this is also like um, our first, you know, uh, like official year of of going into everything. Mm-hmm. So this is ironically enough, this was my year. Yeah, no, no, no. Your, right? your your year was the first year I was out of the band. Oh, out of the band. Okay, yeah. I got you. Okay, okay. <laughs> and. Uh, and and back as Rob Ford and also a new as Creative Minds, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, so it, it was just a challenge because we were still trying to figure out what the program was, which was hard in of itself. 
and give us give it its true identity. Now you throw in this extra tension and, and drama of well, well, Rob's banned from the festival, so he can only be so helpful because he he's limited in that sense. Um, but somehow we got through it uh, the, the 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 two years, um, and, and even in doing that, the program grew as far as numbers. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was a very turbulent and trying two years. Um, and my buddy, who I was working with at that time, after those two years, considering you know we had now beef with the French and the program was going through some growing pains, if you will, and none of us or, or neither of us, between two of us, saw this as like what we were trying to do with our life and wasn't something we had planned. But we 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 found ourselves getting really stressed behind it, you know. Mm-hmm. And it, essentially, just it wasn't fun anymore, you know. Mm-hmm. It started fun to make some noise and make somebody else's life difficult and talk to Kodak and all these cool things. But now it, it wasn't that anymore. And, um, and you know, he, he came to me at the end of this, the, the second festival or second year and was basically like, um, I, I don't want to do this no more. You know, he was like, uh, I want to direct movies. That's my ultimate goal. Um, and I'm not really seeing how, all of this drama and this time and this effort and the investment we're making in all this stuff is getting me closer to that. So it's just not worth it for me no more. Mm -hmm. And I I totally respected it. I totally understood and and I didn't have any disagreements. Um, But for me personally, I didn't feel the same way. You know, I felt like I, I wanted to produce. So I feel like it was prime for me to be there because I need to meet people, people like industry companies as far as relationships and people like yourself who are the next wave of talented people coming with projects and ideas and, you know, to get involved with helping people go in, go, go forward, but in a creative fashion as well. Mm-hmm. Um, two, at the time, we only had a networking program, an internship program, and I knew I always wanted to have that creative component in place as it relates to the filmmaking, which is what you participated in as well. And we didn't have that yet. And so for me, it was a situation of like, I can't walk away from something until I fully exhausted all of the possibilities of that thing working. Yeah. Um, so when I give it my all and I know I've seen it through and it's fully matured and blossomed and it still doesn't, you know, prove to be successful, then I can walk away. But I feel like we were very much still in a developmental stage. And then for me personally, I feel like it was aligned with my future goals and my future career. And so I told him, I was like, I want to keep doing it. And so he gave me his blessings to, to move forward on my own and, you know, to continue pushing. And that's what I did. And so the first two years, uh, 2006 and 2007, the program was called um, Project Can. And it was a collaboration between my company, Creative Minds, and my buddy's company, Northbound Entertainment. And so once, you know, he stepped away and I moved forward on my own, I just moved forward as creative minds. And he didn't ask me to do this and wasn't like there's some type of legal scenario. But just for my peace of mind, out of respect, and to kind of come clean, I changed the name of the program from Project Can to Creative Minds in Can. And that became the branding of Creative Minds. And then I made a partnership with another company called Campus Movie Fest, who runs these filmmaking uh, opportunities, you know, for colleges in a two-week format, which was perfect for what I needed for Can. So they basically came and just dropped, dropped their business blueprint right into our program, and that gave us the film program. So when you came, that was the first year we had, once again, all three, uh, film, intern, and networking. And that was the first time I saw, like, okay, this is, one, what I want it to be, but now it needs to be refined. And that, yeah. like, back to your point about, like, it seemed good to you, but... It, it seems strange that it still needed more work. That's why, because that was the first year. And even for you, I don't know if if you realize it, but you said you worked an internship with Vision Films and you made a movie. That was the first and only year we allowed people to do both. um, Because, I mean, you handled it well, but for others, it was a little overwhelming scheduling-wise trying to do both. So then we separate those two programs. Um, And now from 2009 on, everybody has to pick one or the other or or networking. and, uh, yeah, so I started 2008 as Creative Minds, you know, by myself. Um, the numbers did drop a little bit because it was a new company, a new name, a new product for people to be like, wait, what is this? Um, but, you know, um, the partnership with Canvas Movie Fest really, like, clearly 
delineated into three programs, things picked up really, really quickly. So I'd say in 2009 when you came, we had maybe like 20 to 30 people, something like that, uh, 2009. And as of 2014, you know, the program we just completed this past May, we're up to damn near 200 people. Wow. You know? Yes. So in a span of, what, five, six years. Mm-hmm. And now, I mean, it's like, you know, when, when I came to the program, there was, uh, you, you come to the program, you stay in a hotel, and uh, you sort of, like, commute back and forth. But there was, you know, like you said, only 30 people. So there were other residents at this hotel. Now you have the whole entire hotel filled with program participants, yes, right? Yes, yes. We literally, um, and I think it's, shit, maybe eight floors, I think, but we book the entire hotel. Like, they, they, they have no other customers. They don't <laughs> solicit their business. We have our entire program in this one location. It's been that way for probably like the last three or f- maybe three or four years. Um, um, staff, participants. Villa, you know, shout out to Villa Mapusan. Yeah, Villa Mapusan. <laughs> and we've gotten so big now to where we have spillover to where we're putting people in the hotel next door because Mapusan can't facilitate you know mm-hmm. our, our our entire group um yeah which is insane i think the year you came we literally may have had like maybe a floor you know yeah, in, yeah. in the entire hotel and we've gone from that to the entire building and of course they love it because they don't have to do no work and yeah. they're brought out for the entire festival um but yeah so uh 2008 started creative minds and then um 2009, I was approached uh, by a mutual colleague who is from Toronto and has relationships with that festival to basically bring the idea and the blueprint to to what they call TIFF, Toronto International Film Festival, and try it there. And so the first year was very rocky and we didn't get a great response. And I don't even think it actually happened. But then the next year, which at this point would probably be in like 2000, maybe 10 or 11, um, we launched the first program there. Um, and that was probably the same thing, maybe like three to five people, even smaller than can, um, uh, for that program in 2000, say 2010. Uh, and now 2014 for Toronto, we're scheduled to bring 75 people, which is in shit, uh, about six weeks, September 3rd, the mm-hmm. 11th. That's the next big festival we have and program we have coming up. So we're putting all the finishing touches on that as we speak, uh, and preparing for, for that program. And then, uh, last year, um, we decided to expand even more and we opened up three additional new programs, which were AFM, Sundance and Berlin, all in that order. Mm-hmm. Um, and so now we're at five festivals, you know, worldwide and, uh, it's insane. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and so, okay, let's, let's talk a little bit about, you know, uh, um, I mean, you know, now the other festivals, they're, you're all in some sort of official capacity with, uh, with each festival mm-hmm. now. Well, now all five actually, mm-hmm. right? Um, so, you know, you, you know, let's, let's, from, from being banned to now, you know, having, having an official sort of relationship and, you know, being able to get things done in a, in a, in a quick fashion with, uh, with Ken and, and these, all these other film festivals, I mean, what made you want to keep going and saying, like, you know, after facing all that adversity, being banned from a festival, you know, I mean, it's it's like a, a, a crazy story to say, like, yeah, I was once banned from this festival, but now I work in, like, an official capacity with this festival, you know? Right. So, like, what made you say, like, well, I know what I'm doing is right, and I just have to keep going? Yeah. Well, I guess to button the other end of the story, because I don't know if we didn't even get into the official part, but... Um, after being banned, you know, we operated, so I was banned in, uh, 2006 to 2008, 2009. Um, I started anew with creative minds by myself, no longer with my buddy. Um, and from 2009 to 2014, um, we were basically operating independent of the festival doing our own thing as far as getting people there, getting them accredited, setting them up with internships, basically running our entire program. And 
it was a situation of like we had no other choice because coming out of the band, obviously the festival wasn't going to like say, okay, yeah, like now we're embrace you. Let's figure out how we work together. It was a situation where we were still very much under scrutiny, Mm -hmm. under watch. I mean, once again, the wire, like we knew the block was hot. And every time we showed up, people were like watching and trying to find a, a slip up so they could like access again. And so it was, it was hard. And, Mind you, the program is growing exponentially. Like the numbers are almost doubling every year. And so the larger the program gets, the harder it is to float under the radar and to keep it low key and to get everything taken care of the way you need it to. And so it finally reached a sort of a breaking point of where I just realized that we weren't going to continue to be able to operate in that space with the growth we were experiencing if we didn't have their endorsement. And so I went, you know, to the festival and kind of, I mean, if you guys, if anybody's ever seen Heat, it's like the Robert De Niro, Al Pacino meeting in the diner where it's basically like, I know who you are. I know what you're doing. I know you're chasing me. I know you're trying to get me. And they're like, yeah, we want you out. We don't, you know, we don't support you. And everybody's kind of laid their cars out on the table. Um, And for me, it was like, I I have to do this because going back to your question, I was at the point where I was, well, just, just to be real with everybody, like I've considered on many occasions walking away from this and quitting and just being like, I'm good because it's not worth it. And I don't want to do it. And to answer your question, what has kept me going or, or kept pushing me is literally every time I get ready to like peace out, I will get an email from somebody saying, um, I just want to tell you, I got a job working, you know, for so and so company, which is the company I interned with when I was in Cannes. And had it not been for the program, this never would have happened. Thank you so much. Or I get a thank you card, you know, mailed to me, and it's like, you know, I went to the program. It changed my life. I had never traveled out of the country. Now I understand this, that, and the other. And I'm just so, so, so thankful. Or somebody sent an email, and you know, I met this person at the program. We're now working on this project together, and we're best friends for life and without this program. And so I just kept getting these, I guess, testimonials that were reassuring from the people that were going through the experience that it was working and they were benefiting from it and they were connecting and they were breaking into the industry and they were creating product. And it was one of those situations where you just kind of step back and you realize like, yo, this is bigger than me, you know? And I'm just, I'm just a conduit. I'm just a catalyst. I'm just the person who's moving it along or facilitating it. And yeah, if I got to get roughed up a little bit along along the way or take some bumps or some hits, um, so be it. But that's that's like that's you know I don't want to get all like spiritual and religious and all that. But it's like you you realize it's it's there's there's a higher calling at play here, and 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 you have to make some personal sacrifices for the greater good of others. And that's what your role is in this. And you can't quit, you know. You, you you can't give it up. You can't stop because people need you, you know. And they, they need the opportunity. They need the contest. They need the resources. They need what you are facilitating to, to get where they're trying to go. And so for me, I, 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 I just realized, like, dude, it's, it's, it's not about how I feel or what I'm going through. Like, I realized that I was working for something that had a, a, a bigger picture, a greater cause, um, and it was truly helping people. And ultimately, that, that for me personally, that is what I've always wanted to do in, with my life mm-hmm. and, you know, my time here on earth is, is to be a service to others. Um, I genuinely, as weird as it may sound, but I genuinely get personal happiness from seeing other people happy in general, but even more so if I am the creator or facilitator of the thing that's making them happy and so i got into film all along from the jump to be to be honest and frank because i wanted to make content particularly for black people that made them feel better about themselves and make them feel good that's where it started it's evolved now into more worldly global you know perspectives but it's always been about using media and film and art to enhance one's self-esteem mm-hmm. and to create opportunity for others and allow them to achieve their dreams. That, that, that is my dream. And so um, 
it was being manifested. And when you, when you realize like this is what your life's mission is, and though it seems turbulent, and there's a lot of turmoil, you're actually achieving these goals and having success. You can't walk away. You, yeah. you just got to push through. I mean, there's really no other option. And so that that was the motivation and the peace of mind and the poise that allowed me to come back to the festival after the first letter saying stop and then the second letter saying you're banned and then being banned for two years and then still coming back by myself without the partner with a new new name, new company um, and still going and saying, hey, um, I need you. Like, I know you guys think I'm this bad guy and I'm running this like scam and, you know, taking advantage of people. But look what people are saying to me. Yeah. You know, they're getting jobs. Look what, you know, the video that we're putting together and what the sound bites these people are saying about the experience and what they're learning. Look at what the industry is saying about how valuable it is to have these interns there helping them do their. I was like, and we're talking about legit companies, like, you know, I mean, who just yeah. rattle off some of these. Paramount, Focus Features, Fox, uh, William Morris, UTA, ICM, uh, Paradigm. All of these people are coming to you to look to provide internships for these various festivals. Exactly, yes. So much to the point now where I don't even have to reach out. Like, when the festivals run around, they're like, Rob, what's up? You know, we need our people. You got it. And so, and I'm telling the, the, the festival as well, like, the same companies that are coming to your festival, spending loads of money, bringing their talent, their film, their projects, and doing major business here, we're servicing them and we're helping them do their business. So how is this not counterproductive for everybody involved, you yeah. know? And, uh, you know, so I, I, I'm knocking down doors. I'm trying to get meetings um, and I'm getting slight reception, but still not what I really need and not to the person I need. And it took maybe six to maybe eight months to finally get the meeting with the man, you know, uh, who is sort of the decision maker to get things where they need to be. Um, you know, fortunately enough, he came to L.A. for the American film market, which it was so timely that we were just starting a program in that space as well, which he had heard about. Um, and I had sent him several emails and had other people reach out on my behalf. And finally, he responded and said, I'm going to be in L.A. Here are the dates and times. Let me know if you're available to meet. We meet um, the meeting went really really well i mean it had its peaks and his valleys um but in the end it went well and it, it left with a very promising sort of you know tone um and then maybe two months after you know he got back to france and met with his team and they were able to sort of figure out a way to 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 make us a, a formal proposal to work with the festival and that's what we did this year in 2014 officially for the first time and you're right man it, it was the whole thing, still to this day, as of this conversation, in this moment, it still seems surreal. Mm -hmm. Because he was the individual who sent the initial letter. The band. The band. <laughs> yeah. it, it was signed by him. It yeah. was sent from him. I mean, obviously he had like their legal, you know, franchise company, whoever represents them. But he was the, the representative on behalf of the, the festival who initiated that. And cut to almost a decade later... I'm sitting down with this man, you know, on on Ocean uh, Boulevard, right in Santa Monica, having sushi, talking about getting involved with the festival. Um, and the whole time, man, I just, I, I, like, internally, our team jokes about it being like the Godfather when, you know, uh, Michael Pacino's character ghost for the meeting, yeah. you know, and they got the gun in the bathroom. And it's like, it was one of those, like, dude, is this a good idea? Like, are we walking into an ambush? Like, how can this even be happening? But he was such a, a, a kind-hearted guy. And, you know, it's like a lot of things in life. It's not what you think. Mm -hmm. um, you just got to get to a certain place of reception, and then you see people in a whole other light. Um, and ultimately, at the end of the day, like most people, he's a businessman. Um, and we had legitimate business to be able to offer um, in exchange and, and, to, and to work with and provide. And um, I think that was the big difference about the, the meeting we had this time versus in the beginning. We had nothing to show yeah. because we were just, you know, two young guys trying to do our thing. Um, but, yeah, he embraced us and put together a proposal. And we got the, you know, the official setup. And it was by far, like, no 
comparison the best year we've ever had at the festival everything was so seamless and so smooth and it was just about the participants and their experience and making it a quality time and once we had that locked in that became the launching pad for uh the other festivals because as you said like can is a big dog so once you can it's like New York City. Once you can survive in New York and yeah. do business there, you can go anywhere else because it only gets easier from there. Yeah. So we went to Sundance, we went to Berlin, we went to AFM, all with the sort of calling card of we're at Cannes, we're doing this, um, we're now you know being embraced and we want to start you know working with you as well. And it's a trip, but it's like everything else, like you said, happened like rapid thereafter. We got right to the right person. Yeah. They were so receptive. They entertained the idea. And then it was like, okay, let's just figure out how we make this happen, and that's that's where we are now. Now let's, uh, you know, that's I think that's a, a a good 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 note to to wrap it up on. Um, but but also I want you to talk about sort of like what is the future and what are you doing now? Um, you know, because we've got some like obviously video stuff and then post event or post uh, post festival Absolutely. events in various cities and all this stuff. So t tell people a little bit about that um, and what you have going on. Got you. So like the sort of the new um, short-term immediate, I guess, initiative, if you will, is all about the alumni. So folks like Jabari and, and many others who came through the program, you know, a few years ago are now out of school. M lots of folks have relocated to L.A. and or New York as the primary entertainment hubs. And they're doing awesome things. And a lot of these people only know the people, as your body's mentioned, like that they were in the program with for that festival that year. So for Jabari, like Cannes 2008. And so what we realized is much like, you know, uh, Greek life or much like a special membership to a guild or a union, we, we have matriculated over a thousand people. Um, from inception to date to various festivals around the world um, through our program. And that's powerful, um, especially now that these people are starting to make waves in the industry. And what we realize is we've always wanted to have something, as he said, after the festival to keep the momentum and the excitement and to keep people engaged and connected. And we hadn't quite figured out what that was. And we realized that having these alumni sort of events in L.A. and New York is the way to do it. And so I would say since April when we launched the first one, we've been doing sort of happy hour kind of mixers at like really fun kind of swanky spots around L.A. and New York where we invite all of the alumni of our program out. Um, you know, we, we sponsor the evening with food and drinks at a really nice location. And the goal is to allow people to meet other people from other programs, be it Cannes, Toronto, Sundance, Berlin, etc., or to meet people that went to the same program they went to but different years and to network and to help each other and to share ideas. And so there may be someone who just moved to L.A. who needs a job and doesn't know anybody. They can come to the alumni event and meet all these people who are in L.A. working that come from the same world they did as, as it was to Creative Minds. Maybe somebody like Jabari who you know, is working on a project and he needs a shooter or an editor or a director or a producer or whatever the case may be, he can come to an alumni event and, you know, kind of talk that up and, and look for someone to help in that regard. Um, and then, you know, it's all with the backdrop of just having fun. Like people just sometimes need a break and they need to get out and just kind of like let loose a little bit. And so we provide a, a cool ambiance. Nobody has to worry about spending any money and just come out and have a good time. But the, the the real objective is to network and to and to and to reconnect um, because we feel like a lot of people are doing very awesome and influential things and we could all be of service to each other. So we've done, um, you know, like a couple of those in L.A. and New York. And then we added uh, a screening night and the screening night is basically where we get everybody together to watch, you know, um, a new movie. Um, and then there's a Q&A after the movie. Um, and the idea is to put people back in the festival world. When you go to film festivals, um, you get a lot of that. You get movies that screen, and after the people who made it or who are the cast in it or involved in it in some capacity get up and talk and do a QA. and a And it's one of the most awesome things about going to yes. film festivals because you get a whole new perspective on the film. 
And nine times out of ten, you can go up to the people after and just talk to them because they're chill like that. And so we literally just did a screening uh, a Saturday. Saturday, yeah, of uh, Boyhood, which if you haven't seen it, you should see it. Um, it's, which I was so I was I was literally <laughs> ten minutes late and didn't get in because it was that packed. Yeah, this the screening was at capacity. Um, I mean, one, because it's an awesome film. The film is literally shot over the span of 12 years, um, and it shows a boy that grows up, you know. And, and so this is a doc. It, it, most people think it's a doc be, it's, be, because of the concept, yeah. but it's actually a narrative scripted feature film. And intentionally shot Intentionally over. shot over 12 years, oh, wow. which is why, once, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Once, you, once you realize that... Because I didn't get from the trailer if it was a doc or not. No, nah, like, yeah, it, it has that feel, and if it was, a, I mean, it's, it's an ambitious... So even, even the, the other cast around the boy... It's all 12 years. Yes. Oh, wow. Okay. Like when you, you literally see everyone in this movie age on camera, yeah. you know, um, the boy is the most dramatic because he starts at like six and yeah. by the time it's done, he's like 18, graduating from high school, going to college. Uh -huh. um, but like Ethan Hawke is like young when it starts yeah. as well as Patricia Arquette and by the time it's done, you know, they've aged, they've gained some weight. I mean, it's, it's just like real life. So I think people really are intrigued slash respected because... Did they use different like cameras and all that? No, they shot on a 35 throughout. Oh, okay. um, yeah, and they, they even have stuff in there like old cell phones and VHS, play, like VCRs yeah. and uh, Nintendo Game Boys. Wow. But they're not like props. Like they really were using that stuff at that time, uh -huh. you know. Of, of And then the music that they select is all relevant to like the year and the mm -hmm. time of, of that film. It's really, 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 really like well done. And when you just think about how challenging it is from a production perspective to, 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 to calendar and schedule and finance that type of project yeah. it's just a headache to even try to think about it yeah, you know let yeah. alone achieve it and when you watch the movie it doesn't you can't tell it, it mm -hmm. plays so seamless they do a good job they don't even stamp the time frame like one year later uh, or, or yeah. now he's eight years old yeah. they just go to the next scene and yeah. you see like a kid come running out of the room into the hallway and you're like that looks just like the boy you know um from the previous scene but maybe they this is his cousin, or then you kind of realize, like, oh snap, the, the, it's just, this is like three years later, yeah, you know, wow. not like now he's in junior high school, yeah. and his sister, you know, it's like, oh, she's got boobs now, she's going through puberty, you yeah, know, it's like, yeah, but they don't, yeah. they don't tell you, they just, they just <laughs> go, and uh, yeah, so the director, the the main girl, that's the daughter to the brother um, that grows up, is actually the director's daughter, oh, okay. and she, so she grew up, you know, sort of making this movie with him as as he was doing his thing, um, it's just a really, really interesting concept. Um, and, and yeah, the screening went went really really well. Um, like I said, we had a screening, we had the Q and A. Then we usually do sort of like a you know food and drinks after um, for folks to socialize and just kind of reconnect. And so I mean, it's just crazy. The movie started at four thirty. The movie's mad long, so it ended at probably like seven fifteen. Then there was like a Q and A mm -hmm. to put it at like seven thirty seven forty five. And then people came to like eat and drink. The last person didn't leave until probably eleven thirty at night. Wow. And I mean, like, the last group of people, yeah, you know? Yeah. So, for me, it was just beautiful. Like, I had one of those moments, you know, in life where you, like, just do a 360, your whole situation, and you're like, this was just an idea, yeah, you know? Like, I wanted to see people come together and connect post-festival. And, and when I heard somebody come up to somebody and say, hey, my name is Kevin Pinkney, can 2011, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're like, oh, wow, yeah. uh, you know, so-and-so, can 13. I was just like, dude, it's happening. Yeah. Like, you know, like, it's just beautiful it's slash mind blowing at the same time and everyone was so thankful and, and so like you know appreciative of the opportunity and so like dude i just can't even mad like the program was enough and yeah, now you, and this now this, this is happening yeah. you know like dude chill out you yeah, know what i mean so much more man. yeah and so like you said so that's what we're doing now just to kind of get everyone engaged and reconnected and um the big picture of where this whole thing is is, is going ultimately and what we want to do is we all want to make movies you know i'm still uh interested in producing film and that's my ultimate goal and i feel like that will happen you know very much the, the way i saw it from the beginning by building the contacts of the industry which you know we probably have in total across all festivals 
you know, we probably have about 75 different companies that we work with, you know, mm -hmm. so, some more than others, some at Cannes, not at Toronto, but at Berlin, you know, so on and so forth. Um, but 75 companies that, you know, know who we are, look to our service and work with us annually that I can call up for, you know, whatever favors may be needed. Um, like I said, we have over a thousand people that have came through the program as participants. So there's loads of talent and projects and different things in circulation. And so the last piece that we need, which kind of is the segue to your question, um, is money to be able to finance projects and to be able to um, create content. And so what we did was we created a uh, non-for-profit organization as a sort of subset of what we do. And we're in the process of putting together a sponsor deck and a fundraising package to go out and get money to be able to contribute to people like yourself um, who have projects that we think have the ability to go and we want to see them, you know, take flight as alumni of our program. Um, and so that's like our primary goal right now is to, to raise these funds to get projects done. And the ideal is a lot of people, but, but not a lot of people know of us primarily right now as just an, an entity or an organization that runs these film programs, takes people to festivals, help them get into the industry. But we feel like you know, five, ten years from now, will be more recognizable or, or as a household name as an entity that produced an awesome film. Yeah. You know, and that film... And can still be doing yeah, festivals. Yeah, absolutely. And that film went to Sundance or went to TIFF or whatever, and it made noise, maybe won an award, maybe it got picked up. And so the idea is, you know, John Doe at whatever school is a big film person. They follow independent, up-and-coming films or whatever, and they find out um, this awesome project, you know, super fans or whatever it may be, went to a festival and it won. And it's like, um, oh, that sounds so cool. You know, the Creative Minds film went to the festival and won. Um, and so they start doing some research about the company and the film. And they find out that, oh, this same company actually has these film programs, yep. you know, that exist. And that's how they can get involved on a very entry level to who we are and what we do. And then that becomes an incubator to feed and fuel the projects that we have going on. So right now we're like a middleman. We find good, talented people and we connect them and place them with companies in the industry. What we want to be able to do is add ourselves to the list of those companies and say, we find these awesome people and now we can actually put them right in the industry with us mm -hmm. because we're making films and producing films and creating content. And people can see the streamline of like, oh, snap, you know. Creative Minds, one of the producers of Jabari's film, Superfans. Oh, snap, Jabari went to Creative Minds in 2008. That can't be an accident that those two entities are working together on this project. Yeah. So if I can get into the program, I can have a pipeline to maybe working with them with my own projects or just being hired to work on something that they're creating. And that's, that's kind of the big picture, you know. I, I always give people, like, this Will Smith analogy. I don't know why I choose Will Smith, but Will Smith is, is a major box office guy, so that's why. But Will Smith is from, you know, West Philadelphia, born, as he said. And then he starts rapping. Then he gets a TV show. Then he gets a movie, you know. And then that movie blows up, and he becomes, like, Mr. Blockbuster, Mr. Uh, Independence Day weekend guy. And so he has all this fame, this success, this money, so he creates this organization that's like a help, open doors, give back, reach back type of deal to get others maybe from West Philly and, and abroad um, into the industry. And, of course, people are going to subscribe and participate and go to that because it's Will Smith. Mm -hmm. So we kind of did our situation backwards. We created the give back, help, connect opportunity first, but we don't have the celebrity and the acclaim and the, the esteem of the, the respect of the art and, and the finance to get people excited. And that's what we need. And we feel like once we have that, that is the, the manifestation of reaching the true goal. And then what we're doing here just will continue to feed that, you know. Yeah, yeah. And uh, that's that's the plan, man. You know, that's that's the idea. That's the goal. That's what we're working on as we speak. It, it's not going to happen overnight. Um, but I can see it. And once I can see it, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's attainable, it's achievable, because I saw, I saw Cannes, then I saw Toronto, then I saw a three-tier programming. Like, you have the vision, and once it's crystal clear as it is now, it's, it's literally just walking the line to go get it. I yep. mean, that's just it, you know what I mean? It's like we talked about earlier, there's going to be roadblocks and hurdles and divergence, but you got to stay the course, and it's, it's there for you, so... 
I I can't imagine, fathom, or see it not happening. Um, and you know, we just got to do the work, and yeah. and that's where we're at now. Yeah. And um, let people know where they can find out more information about uh, Creative Minds, the various festivals, social networks, all that jazz. Absolutely. Um, so <clears throat> first and foremost, uh, the simple, easy way is our website, which is the creative mind group dot com all one word um we're on uh instagram at the creative mind group um facebook twitter all that jazz uh we're currently at um five festivals uh can which is in may for two weeks we're in toronto at the toronto international film festival that's usually one week in September, which is the week right after Labor Day. So this year is September 3rd through the 11th. Um, we're in American Film Market, which is in November, also for about four or five days. Um, we are in Sundance, which is in January, um, for about eight days for that festival. And then we're in Berlin, which is in February, um, also for about eight days. And then we're looking at doing some expansion, possibly to Hong Kong, possibly to Shanghai, possibly to Dubai, possibly to Hawaii. All of these are like in discussion. So stay tuned for more. Yep. Um, yeah. And uh, I'll put all the links in the show notes for you guys. Um, and man, Rob, I have to get you back on here to talk about your world travels because you're also <laughs> an avid traveler, man. Yeah, um, man. So we, we'll, we'll, I'll have you back on definitely to talk about that. Um, Man, you guys, uh, for those that don't know, I launched my new clothing line, Bi Coastal. Um, man, you guys have been giving a lot of support for it. Thank you so much to everybody that has purchased the uh, Take Flight Snapback, which is our first piece. Um, you guys can go to bicoastalusa.com to check that out. Uh, Colors NYC, um, the Rager is back. The epic party uh, that I throw is back in New York on the 25th. So if you go to nyc.mycolorsparty.com, you guys can get a 50% a discount on those early bird tickets right now. Um, just put in the discount code early bird. And like I said, if you guys are enjoying the podcast, um, if you want me to keep it coming, if you just want to support it um, because you are getting some sort of value from it and, and these conversations are inspiring you, go to patreon.com slash Jabari and you can leave a tip for the podcast as little as $1 per episode. Um, and that just ensures that I can keep it going. And thanks so much for listening. I'll see you guys later. All right. Peace. Peace.